emphasis on transport of molecules and, and so forth. So uh, the, um, I'm going to talk about what happens uh, when you have diffusion of, what can happen when you have diffusion of shapes that are not point particles. And it turns out that it's fairly easy to build various kinds of devices. And I think it's a, an area that hasn't uh, received um, as much attention uh, as it should. And so here's a rough outline. And in particular, if, if anyone knows uh, references in this general area, I'd be most, uh, most uh, appreciative to, uh, uh, to learn a thing or two. So uh, I'm going to do the quick change in general laziness. Um, uh, this is very rough. I had to pull rubble out of the disk, so I apologize for that in advance. So here's sort of how I got into this general area. General area. Um, okay, I used to have a very large old station wagon. This is an eraser, but think of it as a large old station wagon. And there was a parking lot in Santa Fe that I used to park this thing in. And then the, there was an exit with these adobe walls, and the car was really a little bit too large for the exit. But with enough practice, I could kind of just cut and uh, cut the wheels and just would maybe take a little paint off the car, but just barely make it out of the parking lot and onto the street. And so I'd come in this way and exit this way, and this went on for you know, months or whatever. And then there, one day, for some mystery reason, um, decided to go back the other way, okay? So I drove in this way. Oops. Okay, this is perhaps a slightly better drawing, but it took me some moments or, uh, to realize that in fact, I could drive out of this parking lot, but I couldn't drive into it. So, um, for a minute, I'm baffled. Have I, uh, you know, broken the second law of thermodynamics or something or other? But, but no, of course. If I can get out, I can always back in. But in fact, um, uh, it is absolutely true that uh, you can easily design paths such that you can drive a vehicle one way through and not the other. So you could design a city. A city planner could have streets with corners like this, such that all the cars would exit, but they wouldn't be able to get back in. <laughs> So the reason for this, the, you know, the thing that breaks the symmetry is, of course, that the wheels in front of it uh, can turn. And um, okay, so big deal. But then at some point, I went to the literature and tried to find, um, uh, tried to find this. So it's you know, and non-holonomic constraints, da 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 da. As far as I know, not in the literature. Okay, so okay, that's that's um, whatever it is. Um, Let's see if I can do this here. So the reason that this might have some biological um, relevance is, in fact, uh, this is a you know an illustration by by Goodsell of what the interior of an E. coli looks like, and basically, the interior of most everything is jam packed with stuff, and so stuff has to kind of go from the outside to the inside, and then proceed in various uh, highways through this uh, through this mess. Um, and so, in fact, shapes uh, and the interaction of shapes is a fundamental, you know, dominant feature of um, of cellular cellular mechanisms. So, so here's the general picture. You've got a source of stuff, and and a sink of and of various shapes, and just plain old diffusive flow, maybe through a membrane. Maybe you put a membrane here. And uh, so no special um, motive power, pure passive diffusion. So what can happen? Well, the other example I wanted to show, unfortunately, I'm uh, not very good in real time drawing along the lines of things I couldn't find references for. Let's see. I'm not even going to do it. Sorry, I can't do it under time pressure. Um, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Sorry about this. Okay, here's another example of a shape. Okay, 
here's an L-shaped molecule, right? Okay, here it is diffusing, da, 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 no problem, right? So you have a lot of these over here and nothing over here, say. So no problem, out it goes. However, if the thing happens to be oriented the other way, in fact, it can't go, it can't go through. Therefore, you can be guaranteed just by a simple geometry that um, anything that passes through here is oriented in a certain way. So you would have, you know, an active head site, uh, active site on, on the head group or whatever. So you can do sorting mechanisms, positioning mechanisms, very simple, simply just by uh, boundary conditions and geometry. And so let's just really quickly run through. Okay, standard diffusion, we all know this. You've got stuff, it flows downhill, and the stuff is conserved. You do those two things. Oh yeah, so here's Mr. Fick. And, and because I am a, a procrastinator, I have to look up everybody. So here's Mr. Fick. And it turns out, among his other achievements, he invented the contact lens. However, his first contact lens was uh, so uncomfortable, it was just solid glass that uh, it took another hundred years before anybody would actually wear comfortably contact lenses. But he was early in the contact lens business. And he uh, showed fixed law with salt solutions and put a little, put a little uh, hollow ball and sort of forced it down into the dense, here's some dense salt and there's water up here. And so I basically was able to show with different geometry of tubes that this, that uh, fixed law held. And this was 1855. Okay, so all this work, so linear, so you do this and you end up with a diffusion equation. It's linear, it works great for non interacting point particles, right? So you just said prototype, prototypical field equation. You go from a density of particles to some kind of blob. But you can say, you can, you can see just from the structure of the equation that um, um, diffusion is going to be symmetric. Say you have some weird shape uh, hole um, going from left to right, the, the diffusion is going to be similar, uh, going to be the same, right? Um, given given this, uh, if you invert the density of the particles, because each separate particle is um, uh, operates operates is, is the trajectory is reversible, right? So as long as these things are point-like and they don't interact, you're not going to get any any funniness. However. Um, um, okay, oh yeah, this was the L. This is the L, sorry about this. We can remove the differential constraints of the car and just get rectification. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Um, and get, um, and get this, get this, um, get, uh, um, sorting or whatever, um, uh, with a free moving object, and the main the main point to be made here is that uh, is that when this when the L enters this thing, it has to make a decision about whether to enter this way or this way. There's no energetic difference at the decision point, but in one configure the configuration space, there's a path through onto to the future in one direction, and not in the other. And then if you hit the dead end, you have to actually back up. So that's the key thing, backing up. Um, uh, whether or not the uh, the um, object can pass through. So one species two orientations tries. So the question is, can you do this with something even simpler than an L shape, just like two um, two discs of different sizes? So you tried it. Let me just play with this just a little bit because then drop any other shoe. Let's say I have a charged species. What this seems to be saying is that if I have a charged species, I can develop a voltage just by waiting. That well, right? Or am I misunderstanding something? Let's see. Well, there's no charge in this in this situation. I'm, I'm yeah. Well, but, but <laughs> you know, an ionic bond. An ionic bond well, you could turn if if you had a you could turn a concentration gradient into a into a charge into a um, into a this this you could use the mechanism to, into a charge difference a yeah, potential difference. You know, um, put energy. So but but I mostly want <laughs> I mostly wanted to just stay with the geometry. Okay, 
so here's um, here's two. Here's here, let's just slow it down so we can see what the heck is going on. So we've got two. Uh, we've just got a you know it's a complete Hamiltonian system, right? No no friction, no tricks, just billiards. Uh, two sizes of uh, die, right? Big ones and little ones. Now, if I can remember how to do this. So if we put if we put um, big holes, right? Let's see, and we just get plain old diffusion. And both sizes, both um, uh, both you know, the thing will equalize given enough time. Uh, if we have a small a small guy, a small size, well, of course, the little guys can get through. Big guys can, so we've got osmosis. Wait long enough, we get the get an appropriate uh, distribution on both sides. Okay, now we're going to do something just slightly trickier. We're going to make change the shape of these guys. So, so it's a little funnel shape, right? Um, the little guys can get through, the big guys can't. Um, but basically, it looks pretty much the same. Now we're going to make one as, as the single narrow channels. So now we're going to make one more small change. We're going to just invert the shape of this membrane like so. Restart everything. OK, what happens? Well, a few th at first, at first we get some leaking guys leaking through. But then, in fairly short order, um, a big fat guy blocks the uh, Blocks every one of these channels, and the thing goes to a stationary state. So, okay, this is okay. Remember, this is a Hamiltonian system, no friction, no nothing. So, in some natural fashion, we've um, uh, okay. This is an attractor in some sense, right? It wants to do this. It wants to go to this clogged state, even though it's not the equilibrium state. Okay, but that's the point. This is a, this is a kinetic trap, right? Uh, this is a kinetic trap. If I wait for a very, very, very long time, eventually things. That's right. Well, I'll get into that. I'll, uh, I'll throw a few equations on the board. You probably won't have time. But all you have, just to jump to the chase, all you have to do is that this thing is exponentially unlikely to go sure. as a function of the pore. So if you want to make it so it's not going to come out in the age of the universe or whatever, you just make it 10 times longer. Okay, so this is a solid uh, rectifier. Okay. Um, uh, so, it, in a sense, it's an, it's an attractor, uh, um, it's an attracting state, so I just, you know, start over again, boom. And so I'll get it's some other number of, of little guys will go over before these guys clog. But eventually, that's what's going to happen. Um, so let me get back to... Um, okay, whoops, oh. I just didn't get a chance to. Okay, well, we all we got me and my friend Norm got all excited at one point because we started looking at ion channels. Maybe the maybe this uh, maybe uh, this would have some um, basis in uh, it would have some relevance to the fact that you can build a state in a kinetically stationary state just from uh, geometric uh, constraints, and we've. Okay, this isn't an actual picture of an ion channel. It's you know it's 28 angstroms, but this is somebody's model. So, but basically, um, a lot of them are are designed more as like this. You have a narrow part and then a wide part, and this is a, a model for the um, uh, potassium inward rectifying channel. And it turns out, in fact, yes, the potassium little the little potassium ions uh, want to go this way and they can't go this way. Okay, so we got all excited and wrote a wrote a paper and got no, absolutely nowhere with it. So what we did finally, we wised up and um, uh, let's see, and, and, and of course there is theory for the, there is theory for this um, blocking in the, um, in the ion channel literature but, the, but their usual explanation of why the thing blocks is, well, you've got charges, 
you've got you've got charges parked in the membrane, and so your ion comes along here, gets blocked by gets stuck by you know fixed by the charges, and so you have an electrostatic reason for the having this happening, and but our little claim is well no you don't even need to have a binding site here this thing will happen just by pure geometry if you have this type of shape, um, and so how do you tell the difference? Well. You can tell the difference with the um, by looking at the uh, temperature dependence of the system. Uh, this kind of thing will have a uh, have some typical Arrhenius um, uh, factor in it. So once this you know if a thermal fluctuation drives it away a little bit away, and if you have more thermal thermal energy available, it's going to go exponentially quicker to get, to break to break away. However, this thing let me see if I have the So uh, we've got two kinetic models. One is a Kramer's type thing for this for for a blocker to escape and, get, and let the flow uh, recommence. Uh, you've got a Kramer's thing where you have an exponential Arrhenius factor, and then you have chaotic dynamics, right? So you've just got a kinetic probability for this thing to fluctuate, you know, on the time of the universe or some shorter time, depending on how long the floor is. But the um, it just depends on the rate. There's no direct temperature. Uh, no direct temperature dependence of the size of the escape window, so so basically it's just how fast this trajectory is going through the um, configuration space, and that just goes as the you know, square root of the energy, and so that would be that would be a way to tell the difference. So you get a small temperature dependence as opposed to a large temperature dependence for the um, uh, for the for the escape probability. Um, uh, but we had to, we finally did get a get a paper out of this, and the way we did it was go to uh, 25 years ago. I, I was a postdoc in Harry Swinney's lab, and he's a a uh, uh, really eminent guy who does uh, very nice classical tabletop experiments, and, and this was sort of in his ballpark. So he he helped us out in doing this, and so what we what we did was. following um, make a brass make a brass quote unquote membrane and have glass beads of two different sizes one size will go through the other one can't shake vigorously okay at like 10, 10 times gravity and no potential wells just kinetic constraints to look for um, uh, rectification and it, and it worked and just This was what the thing looked like. So just a little micro, whoop, just a little, come on. Okay, I lost the damn thing. Okay, so you make a little chamber with a little brass plate in between the two chambers and shake vigorously and um, you've got lots and lots of beads on one side, and they will, so they'll go from one side to the other side, but not the reverse. Um, and so in a mechanical model, as well as a computer model, um, we get this rectification effect. So for the pure, pure diffusion plus um, geometry, you can get rectification. Okay, so... And so, just to, this is just to show that in the existing existing literature, they do have models along this line. However, they uh, have a have a uh, electrostatic potential to hold these things in place. Um, okay. So this this. Asymmetric diffusion won't happen if you have point particles, linear diffusion equation, because the solutions are independent of concentration. And in the dilute limit, it also won't happen because all isolated trajectories are reversible. But at finite concentration, other particles in the way, are in the way when the blocker tries to back out, can um, 
can uh, keep this from happening. And yeah, I won't I won't trudge through the entire model, um, but we built one. Um, biased random walk. So if you want to go this way, it just flies out with an escape time given by the length of the of the tunnel. But the bias this way, the escape time is uh, exponentially unlikely given the length of the, uh, the tunnel here. And so we have blockers. Anyway, you've got a percentage of open pores. You just make a, a simple little model and Did a pretty good job of, uh, of mod just that simple, just a simple model like that. Does a pretty good job of um, fitting the equation. So here you go. This way, it's just pure diffusion. Uh, you fl it flows smoothly through the whole pores. This way, depending on the length of the pore, you know, the more the more the, you increase the pressure, the more likely it is to plug. So this is a long pore, shorter, shorter, shorter. So a lo the longer you make the pore. The, the quicker it plugs up, or the less pressure difference between the two sides, you need to have this effect. And again, we've, getting, we've got uh, limited traction in the uh, bio, so far, in the, in the bio uh, literature, uh, basically zero traction. I don't know quite. But um, this, is, this general form of for these curves is... Um, there's a lot of stuff in the literature that's quite reminiscent of this. So this, this is the you know voltage across the membrane um, and the flow, and so you get a you've got a uh, uh, no rectification one direction, and this is the rectifying direction. And the, the harder you push, the the um, the less flow you get. Okay. And I guess I should. Uh, um, so the general picture is, uh, okay, so what do you have here? You have a branch configuration space. In one direction, everything, you know, it's, it, you can just flow nice and easily. There's no uh, um, obstacles. In the other direction, you have all these decision points where there's no particular energy difference between, but there's some geometrical difference. Something will go up to get stuck or not, and if you go down on a dead end, you have to back up. Now, if you have a high enough density of these branches, you're just not going to get anywhere, um, and these configuration spaces are common. Uh, are common anytime you have any kind of bunch of uh, shapes uh, sitting, even acting under just plain old diffusion with just a concentration gradient. And the other thing I'd sort of like to mention, we got we got interested in the um, in these ion channels. Um, they're not just holes uh, through a membrane. You'd think they might just you know a hole, maybe a shaped hole, but this is uh, Solved, I think, with the electron, uh, electron microscope, uh, uh, um, and so this is what these things look like. Okay, how? Do, why are they? Okay, actually, okay. So the, the membrane is like this. Okay, and the ions come in the top. There's four channels, and then there's a little, there's some mystery plumbing inside, right? This is the top view and the bottom view. Mystery plumbing. Then they come out the bottom port with four portals. Why? So this is, and there's all kinds of uh, different uh, shapes, and uh, one of the exciting things about the, um, uh, this particular area of biology is that they, they've got various techniques for um, uh, visualizing these things on, a, on a, you know, the angstrom level, and they can now see what they are, and see what they look like, and what the heck. So it looks much more, to my mind, like a, you know, a nanofluidic device than a simple hole. So what is it doing? How is it doing it? I have some crazy theories, and you can look on Vixera if you want to see what. Uh, I won't. Uh. So let me just conclude, okay, with interacting shapes uh, can, can perform computations of arbitrary com complexity, okay? Uh, and the, the one example that's been looked at in the computer science literature a lot is the rush hour type sliding blocks puzzle that also generates lots of dead ends. And let me just see if I can find one. 
picture of it for you. So the typical the typical um, problem of rush hour puzzle is you've got a big block, you have you want to get it out the bottom, you've got all this stuff in the way. And if you ever played with these puzzles, they can be arbitrarily uh, complex and, and, and annoying. Um, so just with sliding blocks, just with pure geometry, you hear these guys build an AND gate, and a, you know, OR gates or whatever, and as soon as you have an AND gate, you know, you can build all possible logic, you, can, you know, build Turing machines or whatever. So basically, every, just with sliding box, blocks, uh, just with, um, everything, all computations are possible. But the speculative thing I just end up uh, uh, with, to conclude with, is um, here's another example. The mover's problem. You've got a piano. It's, the same, it's similar to the parking problem. You've got a piano. Can you get it down? Can you get it up you know, into the elevator and down the hall and into your apartment? Um, it's notoriously hard to put on a computer, and it's been shown to be piece space hard, whatever that means. Exact, I would, don't ask me exactly what that means. So, but it's pretty clear that it's maybe not a good a problem for a register machine. Um, a register is one dimension, right? This thing you have to, you know, do comparisons with every possible corner, et cetera, et cetera. It just burns computer time like crazy. However, this kind of problem. Uh, living systems have to solve all the time, and it's much easier because they operate in parallel and so forth and so on. Um, so maybe there's some other type of, quote, computations going on in, in li living systems that don't have num number numerical representations, no tapes, no registers, except, of course, DNA. But, um, but um, it still goes through a complicated series of configurations to get to an end. Right, so it has some some uh, features of computation, but there are no registers, no numbers per se, no numerical representations. Um, and there's people that sort of talk about this kind of thing. And the, a couple of the buzzwords are morphological computation and embodiment. Um, but once again, any sort of anybody knows references in this kind of general area, uh, I'd be very interested. So, thank you for your time. Questions before the coffee break? So, so just uh, since you asked for reference, are there a couple of people who work on sort of similar things, uh, at least superficially, right? So, so, so Eric Wicks was previously um, Paris student, right? So he works on fully um, dispersed, uh, fully dispersed um, emotions, right? Uh, trying to study sort of particular things like that. And then um, Reinhardt, uh, Cynthia Reinhardt, right, she, she was studying fusion of uh, E. coli in this uh, shape geometry. So I, I'm not sure if you, if you know that. Word. Yeah, well, I think she's one of the very few people that referenced our paper. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but yeah. One more. And, okay. okay. And then, so, sorry. And then Sergey Bezukov works on, on channels. Well, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe I can talk to you later and get these, but thank you. Appreciate it. I have a part from the embodiment or the obvious connection to embodiment. I know that there is a glass physics, I'm not the guess the expert, but there are people who look at the critical slowdown. Essentially, you slow down over many scales in glass physics. You have all time scales. And one argument for having that is that the paths that the particles have to take more and more complicated. Essentially, they explode exponentially, very similar to your puzzle design. That's something that uh, you may want to look at. Huh. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll take up more questions uh, after a little bit of coffee. <laughs> so let's meet back here at half past for the second half of the session. Thanks, brother. <laughs>